Well, we want to welcome you all back to Pastor's Perspective. And this is a format where we're trying to look at some contemporary issues and bring it before the body of Christ. Uh, I was thinking that we could do a show on the shack, and I've heard some good uh, titles for it, Burning Down the Shack, (laughs) things like that. But every other ministry out there is responding to the shack, so I figured we wouldn't deal with that and then when you respond to the shack you have to go watch the movie and I don't want to really watch the movie so we'll leave the shack for other people to deal with Um, the issue we're dealing with and this is part four of a four-part series Uh, and by the way if you have comments or questions please put them in the the blank the box below and um, we'll get to those hopefully in due course And if you want to like us on Facebook or follow us on Facebook, we appreciate you doing that for us. And if you want to watch these on YouTube, we we don't do them live on YouTube, but they're archived on YouTube. You just go to your YouTube search engine and then type in my name, Andy Woods, Pastor's Perspective, and you should be able to locate it. Okay. Uh, But the issue that we're dealing with is not the shack, but we're dealing with the issue of judicial tyranny. So this would be part four of a four-part series. And really what got me going on this whole thing is this poor woman, uh, Baronel Stutzman. I still don't know if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Does that sound right? Okay, Baronel Stutzman. By the way, I should say uh, Jim McGowan's normally here with me. But because uh, we're dealing with political legal subjects, we have an in-house expert. (laughs) She doesn't want to be called an expert but she knows a lot about politics and she has a heart for getting Christians involved in politics and that's Tom Aaliyah Bench, Sugar Land Bible Church member. I should introduce myself too. Uh, my name is Dr. Andy Woods. I'm the pastor teacher here at Sugar Land Bible Church and really what got me interested in this whole subject is this poor lady, Baronel Stutzman in the state of Washington, 72 year old grandmother and she had a longtime client. Uh, she she's a florist, and this uh, client uh, basically decided at, at one juncture that she wanted her to use her services for him, her, his same-sex wedding. Mm-hmm. And she recommended three other florists in the process of turning him down. So she politely declined because it violated her conscience. For her to be involved in that, she's apparently a Christian. You know, she has a biblical conviction about homosexuality, so no big deal, right? You would think it'd be no big deal. Well, then she finds herself under the barrel of a uh, lawsuit, and people may have read about this case in the news. You know, it goes all the way to the Washington Supreme Court, and the court nine to zero, not even one dissenting voice, you know, decides to rule against her. So what I think is happening, and we've covered this in prior sessions, is number one, the civil rights movement is being hijacked. Uh, People want others to believe that discriminating against a homosexual, the way I've described it, is the same thing as making Rosa Parks sit at the back of the bus in the middle of the civil rights uh, movement that took place in this country. you know, the late 1950s and early 1960s. And we've tried to explain that that's an apples and oranges comparison. You can't make that comparison. And when you expand civil rights beyond the traditional criteria, what it does is it puts you on a collision course with an existing right. In fact, can you reread quote number 13 by Daniel Horowitz in Conservative Review? And he explains this in language you know, far better than I could explain it. This is from uh, February of this year. Mm -hmm. What happens when courts create faux rights, such as the right for foreign nationals to immigrate, the right for states to demand more immigrants from the federal government, the right for illegal aliens to obtain driver's licenses, or the right to 15 days of early voting? Inevitably, the courts overlook the most foundational of rights that are written in plain English, the ones that serve as the foundation of our republic. 
So when he says faux rights, that's a French term, isn't it? I think it is. It means a false right. Yes. It means just creating willy-nilly out of thin air uh, a right to same-sex marriage or whatever and deviating from civil rights criteria in the process. When you do that, it shrinks other rights. And this is what's happening with this poor woman, the 72-year-old grandmother in the state of Washington. Her right to freedom of conscience is being uh, shrunk, I guess I could put it that way, or impinged upon. And in prior shows, we've, we've shown exactly that that's what's happening. The court, in doing this, is violating the conscience clause of the Washington State Constitution. And they're violating the premise, you know, that America was founded on, you know, the right to express conscience. So we've dealt with this collision course between the new civil rights, the manufactured civil rights, and conscience. And so now today, you know, we find ourselves, you know, it, I've used this example before, but let me just use it again. It would be like a uh, Holocaust survivor who happens to be a baker or a florist being compelled to use their services at a Nazi rally in the name of civil rights. I mean, that's what the Washington Supreme Court is forcing this lady to do. Uh, because she's standing on a belief that homosexuality is a sin. It's not some kind of arbitrary belief. This is the teaching of Christianity for 2,000 years. And she's just standing on a basic biblical truth. She doesn't want to be compelled to use her services for what she considers to be sinful activity. She's not discriminating on the basis of race, which would be wrong, of course, under civil rights law. Um, and what's happened is her right to free exercise of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, which are all part of America and America's history and traditions and culture and founding documents, that right is being trashed. And so that's sort of what we've tried to do to develop, you know, in the last uh, two or three episodes that we've had together. And we've even gone into actual language of the over. Christian in the United States of America needs to pay attention to this collision course. Uh, everyone that owns a, a Christian radio station, Christian bakery, Christian uh, restaurant, florists, even churches, uh, the day is coming where they too could conceivably be compelled against their own conscience. And everybody's speaking out for the manufactured right, but what about the existing rights? And so... Hopefully this makes sense, but that's what we've been trying to explain, this collision course that we're now in. So we, uh, we've done a good job painting this parade of horribles, and it's easy to just stop talking at that point, but now it's like, well, what do we, what do, we do about it now that we're here? And I believe that there are actually very practical things you know, that we could actually do to slow down this trend. And one of the things I love about the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, and people will see this in Acts 16, beginning around verse 35, 36, to the end of the chapter. This is the first time Paul does this in Philippi. Uh, I think it was his second missionary journey. Is He uses his rights as a Roman citizen to advance the cause of the gospel. And we, as Christians in the United States of America, have bequeathed to us all these rights that still exist, even though they're shrinking rapidly. And we can still use those, I believe, to advance the cause of the gospel. And I would put that under the category of stewardship. You know, a steward is not a, an owner, but a manager. Mm. And all of us have three things we're given by God to manage. Time, these all begin with the letter T, by the way. Time, talent, and treasure. The, these are things God gi gives us not to own, but to manage on His behalf. And He's going to call us to an account, you know, regarded to how we manage those things for Him. And one of the things I think we're stewards of is this country. I mean, it wasn't, uh, I, I didn't choose to be born here, it was a gift. And, you know, I live and breathe with freedom today that most of the world doesn't have. And I, do, do, I think the Lord's going to call me, uh, hold me accountable regarding my stewardship of this country. I know you have some thoughts on that.
Do you view that that way, the United States of America, as um, a stewardship? Or what's your paradigm? I, um, I, I do see us as having this stewardship of the freedom that we didn't earn. You know, it, it was passed down to us. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> through great sacrifice, too. <laughs> yes. And I also feel that then we have the um, stewardship to use that freedom to advance the gospel. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's why this nation is under such attack, mm. is that uh, the long war against God mm -hmm. is to stop the gospel. So if Satan can take down America, he destroys a major lighthouse that God has used for the last over 200 years to be a light to the nations. Yes. So that's why we're in this conflict that we're in. I mean, it's ultimately spiritual, is what you're saying. Spiritual yes. warfare. Good, good, good point. So we've, we've told everybody the bad news. Uh, what's the good news? I know you have a lot of thoughts that we'll hopefully get to a little later. But here's some things I wrote down. Number one, voting. Um, now, this statistic, you asked me once where I got this from. And it's uh, I think it's found in a lot of different ministries that I follow. I don't think there's any one place. but the And I've heard Ted Cruz when he was running for president, you know, use these numbers. But the bottom line is, of all the people that name the name of Christ in the United States, half, half of them are registered to vote. Of that number that actually show up and vote, uh, they vote based on things other than Scripture. So they vote based on the way their parents voted. Uh, is my... Am I going to be in that new tax bracket? Maybe an economic reason. Is my business going to get the new government contract, which will help me to keep my job? And people aren't looking at what the Bible says and comparing it to the ballot box. So what I'm saying is we've we've intentionally shrunk our numbers. We don't register, and when we do vote, we don't vote for the right reasons. I believe the whole country would be different. We wouldn't even be talking about this collision course that we're all in if everybody that named the name of Christ was registered and voted not necessarily Republican or Democrat, but biblical principles every single time. I believe the whole country would be a different place, and that's why I did the series, you know, at our church prior to the election. You know, I started it July 4th and ended it at the end of October, so it just kept going on, but people really liked it. Um, and the people that didn't like it, you know, the exits are clearly marked, you know, as, <laughs> as we like to say. But to equip people to vote based on biblical principles. And with the state of Washington, what are we dealing with here? We're dealing with a state Supreme Court, mm. which which is different than a federal court. Federal court, they're appointed for life for um, six years. Six years. You called it retainment. So you, you don't necessarily vote against somebody like it's a contest, but, but you vote to keep them or to not keep them. And here's the great secret out there, state of Washington. Most people don't vote in judicial elections. Now, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing for our side. Because if you organize a conservative constituency... You can actually, with, with uh, enough votes, even if you're living in the bluest of blue states, vote a justice out of office. And even if you don't vote him out of office, you can come close to voting him out of office, which is a good thing because you can put the fear of God into him. And you can make them recognize that we're watching you. So I was just in the state of Washington speaking with the Stealing the Mind conference, and I spoke to a very conservative group of people. And here's what they told me. And they told me this in New York. I was in New York one month earlier. They were basically saying this state is basically a conservative state. It's because of population centers in this city and this city over here that, that tilts it into the blue you know, category. And um, this is why the left, by the way, wants to abolish the Electoral College. 
because what they're what they've done in Washington and New York they want to do for the whole country they want to just rack up liberal majorities in the West Coast and the East Coast where people vote based on uh, you know where the, the population count carries the day rather than individual states and they could ignore flyover country and so the left has been very good at taking conservative states like Washington and uh, New York and putting them in the blue column not because those really represent the values of the whole state county by county but because that's what the population centers are moving towards so here's the deal these population centers a lot of them don't even show up and vote in judicial elections so if we can get that flyover territory organized and to go to every one of those state Supreme Court justices that did this terrible thing to this lady and vote them out of office do you think that wouldn't send a message um, and and the pastors in the pulpits need to be talking this way the way I'm talking um, and this is not academic for me uh, I remember in the state of California where a governor Brown now did you know that <laughs> Did you know that when I was a kid in California, Jerry Brown was the governor? He was like a swear word in my house. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I grow up and move away, and lo and behold, he's back with gray hair. It's like a, it's like a nightmare. It's like, what is it, Freddy Krueger or the Terminator, you know, mm -hmm. that never dies. They just keep coming back. But I remember when J Jerry Brown... The first go around was the governor of the state. He put in onto the Supreme Court a woman who had no trial experience. She was an ideologue and a law professor. And she and a couple of other jurists just decided that they had a philosophical problem with capital punishment. And so, just out of the clear blue, she started overturning all the death penalty convictions. And you know what the state did? This would go about mid-1980s. They said, forget this. You're coming up in six years, and a conservative uh, majority, if I could put it that way, in a state that was still fairly red, moving into the pink direction, you know, during that time. But they rose up, and they voted her out, uh, put an end to her whole career, and they voted, uh, I think, if I remember right, going back to the 80s, about two to three like-minded jurists and that sent a message that we're not going to go this direction and I think the power to do that is within the good people of the state of Washington and you you uncovered some newspaper clippings uh, of criticism of what the state did why don't you share some of that with us well the one was November 8th 1986 and this was the New York Times a gentleman by the name of Robert Lindsay and the headline was defeated justice fearful of attacks on judiciary so when you read the the article then uh, she mm -hmm. uh, she was the chief justice yep uh, Rosebird she was quoted and she was lamenting that this meant that the independence of the judiciary was under attack so she immediately claimed victim status. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was referenced in an article from November of 2010 at the New York Times. And <clears throat> that was in response to the fact that the uh, voters of Iowa removed three of their Supreme uh, Court justices. They were the three that were on the ballot, all three of them were removed mm -hmm. by the voters and this was because their Supreme Court had unanimously um, mm -hmm. rewritten the definition of marriage. Oh, right. So uh, you know you go back you look at the New York Times and as you look at that article from November 4th of 2010 then you find the reference to the one in 1986 and in both ones they're they're claiming victim status mm -hmm. that if if they do not get retained then uh, the judiciary's independence is at stake well, and under attack well the reality of the situation is the people that put together the state governments and constitutions didn't want a completely independent judiciary and that's why they subjected them to, to six-year term yes 
So this all this talk about you know the judiciary is under attack, that's not the way it was set up in that particular state. So what the good folks in the state of Washington need to do is they need to go and, and find the names of every single judge that voted against Baronel Stutzman in the case called Washington versus Arlene's Flowers. There's nine of them. And you should take their names and you should put them on your refrigerator or wherever, you know, where you do your, sh your shaving in the morning and remember their names. And when you get the chance to vote against them, you should vote against every single one of them. And that's the best way to stop this out of control judiciary. That's the easiest thing I can think of. And uh, that requires people not be apathetic. You don't have to just sit there like an abused spouse and put up with this. Uh, the, st the good people that put together this state of Washington Constitution gave you recourse. God wants you to have that recourse. And just like Paul, who used the, his legal rights as a Roman citizen to advance the gospel, you should just go out and do the exact same thing. And you, it, think if every Christian in the United States thought that way. Think if every pulpit in the United States of America was talking like I'm talking now. Think how different the country would be. You know, this collision course between manufactured civil rights and right of conscience wouldn't even exist. It would just be beaten back, you know, in a heartbeat. But we don't, we don't flex the muscles that God has given us for whatever reason. And uh, we just kind of sit by and say, well, this is the last days. Now, I'm a last days teacher. I'll, I'll talk about the book Revelation. It's my favorite book of the Bible. I love talking about the last days. But here's the reality. According to 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 7, there's a restrainer on the earth right now holding back the progress of evil. And to make a long story short, that restrainer is the work of the Holy Spirit through the church. So what you have to understand is, yes, let's talk about the last days and the Antichrist and all that stuff, and I'll lead the charge talking about all that. But let's not buy into the devil's deception that we're powerless. God has not made us powerless. Uh, he's, he's told us that we're here to restrain evil, and he's put us in a country where our mere presence at the ballot box influences public policy. You know, so let's like let's grow up and, and act and act let's let's utilize the power God has given us. I gotta control myself here. I'm gonna start preaching a sermon in a minute. So anyway, that's that would be option number one. By the way, Rose Bird, I think she passed away not too long ago, but she kind of rehabilitated and she got like a makeover and changed the color of her hair and things like this. And so she started appearing in places where defeated liberals go on on news shows. She became a news analyst. And that's where I prefer to see people like her. You know, liberals to me are really, really funny on TV and radio and in academia. They're really scary when they have political power. So let's just kind of move them on out <laughs> and let's let them be career, have careers as television analysts, you know, and things like that. But let's not let them, you know, exert political authority over us. So this can be done. It's been done in the state of Cal uh, California. Iowa, you just yes. mentioned. Did you? I don't know. I don't want to put you on the spot, but what year was that? That that was 2010. So that's fairly recently. Yes. What I'm talking about is something that happened in the 80s. Yes, that was November. Uh, well, the article was November 8th of 1986. So I would presume. Right around that it was, time. Yeah, probably. November. And what I think is the good people of Iowa remembered what happened in California, and it created courage. It said, well, they did in California. We could certainly do it out here in, in more of a conservative area, Iowa. This was a time that the Tea Party movement was really um, rising in America. So I, I do believe that they understood the power they had. Uh -huh. And here's the deal. You know, I don't, I don't show up at, at a lot of elections to vote for people. I show up to vote against people. <laughs> yeah. And... and you can show up with these nine jurists and vote against them. You don't have to be Republican or Democrat. You're just against the idea that right of conscience is being violated. And you should remember who those jurists are or, or put a list up of them up on your refrigerator and remember the plight of Baronel Stutzman. And one of our problems is our memories aren't very long. 
you know, like Jerry Brown. If people had remembered how Jerry Brown, Governor Moonbeam, acted, you know, his first go around as the governor of California, uh, they might remember to vote against him in his second attempt at the office. But most people don't remember. Right. And uh, you need, we need to be good stewards of what's happened and remember. And the next time you get a chance, you know, flex the muscles that the Constitution and the uh, uh, the Bible really has given us to flex. All right. Second solution is pastoral protection legislation, which I'm so happy passed here in the state of Cal. Cal uh, I'm sorry. We're in Texas. Texas. There we go. The promised land. Uh, do you have quote number 25? Yes. <clears throat> this is from um, May of 2015. What can be done to protect freedom of speech and the free exercise of religion in the midst of this coming legal avalanche against the First Amendment? One option is to see to it that your state government passes into law some form of legal pastoral protection. In the state of Texas, such legislation in the form of House Bill 3567 and Senate Bill 2065 was recently signed into law by Governor Abbott. Such legislation was crafted in anticipation of the very anti-First Amendment decision that blindsided our nation in Obergefell versus Hodges. Here is the legal protection that this new law will now afford Texas pastors. Quote, as the nation anxiously awaits the Supreme Court's decision later this summer in the marriage case Obergefell versus Hodges, which could redefine marriage and lead to the violation of the religious liberty and free speech of people of faith, new federal and state laws are already on the way to help people of faith win in court. Attorneys for Liberty Institute, who know that winning courtroom cases often depend on exact wording of laws, have advised more than 13 states and the federal government to make sure these laws have maximum sturdiness against challenges by the radical left. These are laws that will make it easier to win in the ongoing battle for religious freedom, including the new Pastor Protection Bill, HB 3567, in the state of Texas. The Pastor Protection Bill ensures that the government may not force a pastor, a clergy member, or a church to perform a marriage or related ceremony that would violate their sincerely held religious beliefs, safeguards pastors and churches from having to live in fear that the government will force them to perform marriages that violate their religious beliefs, and helps Texas respect the rights of pastors and churches to hold the biblical view of marriage. So. This comes from the Liberty Institute. This is obviously a little dated because this is what 13 states were thinking about doing before the Obergefell v. Hodges decision came mm -hmm. down. But it's very simple. It, it protects a pastor from having to violate his conscience. In other words, if a same-sex couple mar marches into these doors and demands that I marry them under the, the law, I can tell them no. And every state in the union needs this. You need your pastors to be protected. Uh, if we're not going to protect the pulpit and we're not going to protect the church, as far as I'm concerned, the First Amendment is dead. And this would just reinforce that. And so fortunately, ultimately, what happened is Governor Greg Abbott signed a bill that allows clergy members to refuse to conduct marriages that violate their beliefs and that pastors now have freedom to exercise their First Amendment rights and in fact, uh, I have a little newspaper article indicating when this was finally passed. I think around June 11th, 2015. Can you read that excerpt? I think it's quote number 26. Yes. This is by uh, Liz Crampton. And it says, Governor Greg Abbott, who signed a bill Thursday that allows clergy members to refuse to conduct marriages that violate their beliefs, said that pastors now have the freedom to exercise their First Amendment rights. The signing ceremony for the so-called Pastor Protection Act, which goes into effect September 1, was held outside the governor's mansion. Abbott was surrounded by about two dozen clergy members at a news conference discussing the law. Others attending the signing ceremony included Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, Attorney General Ken Paxton, and Senator Craig Estes from Wichita Falls, who authored the bill. Quote, freedom of religion is the most sacred of our rights and our freedom to worship is secured by the Constitution, Abbott said. Religious leaders in the state of Texas must be absolutely secure in the knowledge that religious freedom is beyond the reach of government or coercion by the courts. With the signing of the bill, 
quote, Texas took a small but important step to further protect the religious freedom of clergy in the face of increasing hostility toward people of faith in all walks of life, uh, Paxton said. No pastor, priest, rabbi, or other religious leader should be forced to perform or recognize a marriage that contradicts his or her sincere religious belief. Estes said the bill is about protecting pastors, quote, who have a strong religious belief, end quote, against same-sex marriage. And see, you know, the Bible says when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. groan. I feel we've been doing a lot more groaning lately than rejoicing. But this is the blessing of living in a state like Texas where you have uh, actual professing Christians that are in positions of authority, you know, like our governor and others. And they're actually looking out for people like myself, and they understand that coercing me to marry a same-sex couple is a violation of my conscience, and they want to make sure my rights are protected. And, you know, <laughs> when you, you have a chance as an American all over this country to vote for people or not vote for people. And one of the things you need to ask any candidate that's running for office, uh, I'm talking about state level, mm -hmm. federal level, local level, even the President of the United States, congressmen, senators, is what is your view on pastoral protection legislation? And you need to figure out where they stand on this. I mean, are they going to create a scenario where a pastor is coerced against his conscience, or do they want to actually, you know, protect that pastor's conscience? And I'm very blessed to live in a state like Texas where I'm, I'm protected. But you know, my brothers and sisters in New York, Washington, that happen to be pastors that may not. Uh, that have the same beliefs I have, they're not protected. So that's that's a very practical thing that we can do, uh, pastoral protection legislation. Do you have any thoughts on that, or if not? No, I think you, I think you got it. That's right. I just talk long enough, and eventually the questions get answered. Um, now, what about florists and bakers? They're not protected. They're not pastors. Mrs. Stutzman is not a pastor. Right. The Kleins that we talked about in Oregon who are being coerced against their conscience. They're not pastors. Uh, Jack Phillips, the Christian baker who's being coerced against his conscience in the state of Colorado, he's not a pastor. So what do you do with them? Um, if you have quote number 27, I want to make people aware of a piece of legislation that was offered but failed to pass. So I'm not promoting a particular piece of legislation, but the idea behind this legislation, uh, if it catches on in Texas and other states, it will go uh, great lengths to protect people of conscience and conviction. So do you have quote number uh, 27? Uh, this was actually authored and offered by our own representative in the Texas House. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what district is that again? 26. 26. See, that's why we have her on. She knows these things. 26, uh, Rick Miller, and I think he had the right idea. And he suffered a lot of pushback by people because he dared to do this. Yes. Uh, and unfortunately, it didn't pass. But I think the idea is right. And should this ever gain traction, bakers, florists all over America will be protected from not having to, their conscience violated. So I don't know. Why don't you read that there it's from some newspaper articles they pieced together? A Fort Bend County Republican has introduced a bill that would bar cities from adopting or enforcing non-discrimination ordinances that include protected classes not contained in state law. Texas law doesn't include sexual orientation or gender identity and expression. As a result, State Representative Rick Miller's House Bill 1556 would undo LGBT protections passed by numerous cities, including Austin, Dallas, San Antonio, El Paso, Fort Worth, Houston, and Plano. Altogether, more than 7.5 million Texans are covered by such ordinances. 
HB 1556 will prevent local governments from expanding business regulations beyond limitations established in state law, Miller told the Observer. <coughs> Competing and inconsistent local ordinances interfere with economic liberty and discourage business expansion. By promoting instead of restricting business growth, this bill is about job creation and an improved state economy, both of which have a direct positive impact on Texas citizens. Quote, because every private business is different, nothing in the bill prevents local businesses from voluntarily adopting their own discrimination policy not c currently included in state law. He added, HB 1556 is more specific than a similar measure introduced by Senator Don Huffines of Dallas. Huffines Senate Bill 343 would bar cities from enforcing any ordinances that are more stringent than state law unless otherwise authorized by statute. Here's how Miller's bill reads. Section 250.007, prohibited regulations by political subdivisions. A, in this section, local law means a law, ordinance, order, resolution, rule, policy, or similar measure adopted by a county, municipality, or other political subdivision. B, a county, municipality, or other political subdivision may not adopt or enforce a local law that creates a protected classification or prohibits discrimination on a basis not contained in the laws of the state. C. A local law that is adopted by a political subdivision before the date of this section becomes law and that violates subsection B is null and void. That's the end of the, the, the language, of, language the, of, the statute. of the statute. Four Collin County lawmakers previously said they planned to introduce a bill similar to Miller's in response to the passage of the Equal Rights Ordinance in Plano. Miller's proposal is also similar to a bill that passed recently in Arkansas. The only other state with a similar law is Tennessee. And this comes from the Texas Observer. This was uh, dated March 3rd of 2015 by John Wright. Now here's what's interesting. You have the same-sex movement showing up at big cities in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are not little cities here. Austin, that's our state capital. Dallas. I remember when they were doing this in San Antonio. Uh, El Paso, Fort Worth, Houston, which is not, you know, we're, we're not officially in Houston, but we're very close. And Plano, I remember when they were doing this in Plano, which is not too far from Dallas. Now, what's interesting to me about all these cities, they're very conservative, and they're very large. Here's a question I have for you. Why are they targeting these big cities? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, even though they're conservative, yes. the governments are liberal. Okay. They're, that, they're, they're a political party that would promote the LGBT agenda. Okay, that's a good point. Here's, here's my thinking on it. These people think that if we can get these ordinances passed in big conservative cities, what could they do to Sugarland mm -hmm. or some other small city? So there's a reason why they're targeting big conservative areas. And the name of the game is to get or city ordinances in place that equate uh, same-sex behavior with civil rights status. Once they have that as a city ordinance, they can go to war against Mrs. Stutzman, Christian churches, uh, Christian owned and operated bakeries, schools, and so forth. And this is why Rick Miller's legislation, which unfortunately didn't pass, would have been phenomenal had it made it through. Because what his law says is any state trying that monkey business, excuse me, said that wrong, any municipality in our state of Texas trying that monkey business that monkey business is null and void. In other words, a, a, a state, a city within a state can no longer pass a city ordinance which equates bona fide civil rights status with LGBTQU. Yeah. And you get that passed and this issue with Mrs. Stutzman and others disappears. 
So uh, what you need to do in your state is you need to promote legislation. That's why we read the actual text of House Bill 1556. Use that sort of as a blueprint or a prototype. You read Section 250.007. And you need to get your state legislators and governors behind this kind of thing. Uh, not because we're in favor of discriminating against homosexuals. Homo as we've pointed out, homosexuals are among the most affluent members of our society. Mm -hmm. USA Today pointed it out. There is no long pattern of discrimination against homosexuals. This is not anti-homosexual legislation. This is pro-religious freedom legislation. This is pro protection of conscience legislation. So we're, we're not here just to paint a parade of horrible scenario. We're giving people practical things they can do. A, vote. Show up and vote in situations where state justices are standing for, for election or re-election or retainment. B, get behind pastoral protection legislation. C, get behind legislation modeled after HB 1556. Uh, we start flexing our muscles a little bit, and this collision course between false civil rights and conscience disappears. And if I could just Please. give a, a, a little tip on how to find this legislation. For example, here in Texas, you can uh, go to our legislature online, to their website, you can look up uh, the previous session. Now, right now we're in uh, the 2017 session, and I forget the number. It's like 85, I think. Um, <clears throat> you can look through the previous years, and that's why we've been so um, diligent to tell you that this was in 2015. Mm -hmm. And so you can go back and look that House bill number up. You can look up that Senate bill number and you can find that text mm -hmm. so that you can look at that. Even if you live in Washington, mm. you can go online and look at our legislature website and find that text of that bill. Mm -hmm. And then maybe find a sympathetic state legislator that would want to introduce something, maybe not identical, but similar mm -hmm. in the state of Washington, in the state of New York, in the state of Colorado. Yes. You know, and so forth. So good. So, so with um, yes, thank you. With the, so with the power of the internet, it's getting harder and harder for for liberals to hide, a what they're doing, and the solutions to what they're doing. Wouldn't you say that? Yes. All right. So there's three th there's three things we've given. These are all legislative. These are external. Um. Let me take you to a fourth thing that I think we could do. This is more internal. And I would call it, call it this, get your own house in order. And what I'm talking about here is rewrite your own church constitutions and your own bylaws. And I'm holding in my hand here a phenomenal document that I will not reproduce. I couldn't reproduce it if I wanted to. It's so good. But this is put out by the, um, let me get you the exact uh, name of this. And unfortunately, I don't have this queued up correctly. I have to sit and scroll through the whole thing. It's called the Alliance Defending Freedom document. Does that make sense? Are you familiar with that group? Yes, Matt Staver. Matt Staver. And here it is. It's called the Alliance Defending Freedom for faith practice. You can find this document at www.alliancedefendingfreedom.org or you can call this number 1-800-835-5233. I'll give you that number again. 1-800-835-5233. Five two three three, or go to the website www.alliancedefendingfreedom.org, and this is a uh, document that's entitled "Protecting Your Ministry from Sexual Orientation 
gender identity lawsuits. It's a legal guide for churches, Christian schools, and Christian ministries. It starts off with some tremendous quotes. Uh, here's a quote by Kai uh, Feld, Feldblum. I don't know if you know that name. Commissioner Equal Employment Opportunity Commission made this chilling statement. There can be a conflict between religious liberty and sexual liberty. That's the conflict we're trying to describe. There can be a conflict between religious liberty and sexual liberty, but in almost all cases, sexual liberty should win. That's the conflict that we're in. Uh, here's a quote from Dr. Jim Garlow, who's a politically active pastor in the state of California. He says, a time is coming when the government will demand that churches accept and promote an understanding of sexuality and gender that directly opposes the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And what this is, and it's, it's laid out so practically, what you can do, it's got a, even a checklist, a checklist for a church, a checklist for a Christian school, a checklist for a Christian ministry, is to sort of uh, write your bylaws, charters, constitutions in a way that are proactive, proactive steps for churches and schools and Christian ministries. The action items listed under this section are applicable to all churches, Christian schools, and Christian ministries to ensure the broadest religious liberty protections available under the law. Because should you find yourself in this collision course, what the law wants to understand is, is your right based on a reasonable standard? Or are you just acting like a racist? Are you arbitrary? Are you capricious? Are you saying things just because you don't like homosexuals? Because okay. uh, they're trying to equate us with racists, basically. And if you can demonstrate through your own uh, bylaws, constitution, articles, and so forth, that your belief related to the same sex agenda is longstanding and reasonable and rooted in history and tradition, and to phrase your documents in that manner, should you find yourself in this collision course in a lawsuit, uh, you, by just taking some proactive steps, can come out ahead. So this is a wonderful document that they've put together. And it's very practical. It's very simple. In fact, here's a picture here of Baronel Stutzman, the, the florist that kind of you know, brought all of these things to our attention. And this is uh, what I would call, you know, an ounce of, how's the saying go? An ounce yes. of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That's that, correct. That, right. So you know you can either uh, drive your car uh, into the ground where you have to take it in for repairs, or you can take baby steps to make sure you know there's enough air in the tires, oil, uh, proper gasoline, so that your car doesn't break down. So what do you want to do? Do you want to just wait for the big lawsuit to hit you because you're standing on biblical truth? Or would you rather take some incremental baby steps to avoid the big lawsuit? Okay. I'll take the latter. Let's, let's do some preventive maintenance. And this document that I'm talking about will give you practical steps related to how to get your house in order. So what are your thoughts on that? You agree? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the yes woman. Yeah. Um, okay. So we've given them, folks, three things they could do externally. Mm -hmm. to influence legislation out there and something that they can do internally. If people go back to part one of this series, um, we talked about some other things that you can do related to federal judges like impeachment and uh, getting Congress to curtail out of control uh, federal court authority. We talked, we've developed that. So by my count, we are not just painting a parade of horribles. We have talked about five practical things people can do. People are not as powerless in this as they think. Right. Now, um, I'm not sure how much time we have, but I know that you've compiled, looks like two to three pages of notes, giving some action steps. And um, yes, why don't you know, given the limit, limited time we have left, I think we only have like five or ten minutes left, maybe you could share some of that and then we can come back next time and what you don't share 
Yes. Today we'll come back next week. But I'll, what, what, I'll what give some, a, yeah, what are I'll some give thoughts? an outline and then uh, maybe next week we can okay. fill it in and amplify it. Okay. But so with the actions that you have outlined, this would be how do you go about that? And uh, you know, as a citizen advocate, and what you need to um, consider is that you have two avenues. One is through the legislative and the second is through the judicial. So um, as, as you have just said, in, within the legislative, the first thing we need to do is stop passing bills that make the Christian worldview illegal. We also need to pass bills that preserve our rights and protect legality of the Christian worldview. We need to restrain judicial activism through actions of the House of Representatives, as mentioned in the part one discussion about mm -hmm. um, restructuring the federal courts. Mm -hmm. So within that, you restructure, restructure the federal courts and limit their reach, or and you impeach federal judges when they do not meet the definition of good behavior. Now, For, your, your average Mr. and Mrs. America, they look at good behavior and that's part of Article Three of the United States Constitution. They, they think it's not having a tattoo or yes. not, uh, you know, making lewd comments from the bench, not smoking. But the definition of good behavior is they follow the Constitution and their rulings. That's good yeah. behavior. It, it's performance review. <laughs> Hello. You know, do you meet standards or do you fail to meet? You know, need to improve. Aren't those the phrases that you get when you go in for a merit review with your employer? Sure. And and, and so. Um, Poor performance on the job, when they render decisions that are violation of law, that's a poor job performance and subject to impeachment. So um, we will amplify that at further discussion. Right, so those are just broad strokes there. Okay, so okay. judicial is the confirmation and the retention of judges, which is what we've spoken a lot about today. And our confirmation uh, generally I have is federal. So that's where you go through the process of the Senate gets to um, have a, a say. Mm -hmm. So pay attention to the confirmation process and research the nominees. Provide input to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Mm -hmm. And we'll amplify how you do that. Um, also, retention of your state judges and your state Supreme Court justices is conducted through the ballot box. And so we have discussed that today. Mm -hmm. So how do you accomplish these actions? This is going to be your persuasive tech, uh, speech techniques that you learned in high school, maybe junior high, where you are working on uh, personal advocacy, you're developing relationships with elected officials, and especially with their office staff. Okay. Okay. So I have an acronym that I developed over the years. Pepper on pie tastes terrible. Pepper is plan. This step is research and data gathering and personal preparation through prayer. On is organize. This step is the identification of your goals, the identification of the audience or the adversary, and their purpose and goals. This is the development of your talking points to achieve your goals. So within organize, you identify the audience or the adversary as one of three groups a hardened ideologue, an uninformed person, or a misinformed person. Each of these requires a different technique. The hardened ideologue will not be changed except through the power of prayer and salvation. So pray for them, but also use two tactics. Discredit their points and discourage them by remaining undaunted. Discredit by finding contradictions in their positions and reveal the unintended or secondary consequences of their position, which is something they rarely consider. And as I say, the, discourage them by remaining resolute mm -hmm. in your position. Mm -hmm. Okay, the uninformed person, which you know you were speaking about the Christians voting earlier, and they may go with this, which is this person goes with the flow because they don't care to research or think for themselves sometimes, Otherwise, they, they just go with what's popular. So make it personally relevant for them by finding a way they would be personally impacted by the said policy. Mm -hmm. The misinformed person. This person tries to reach an informed decision but has been misled. 
present facts that have been buried by the opposition or the biased media that would bring them to a different understanding. Okay. So, you know, as I said, you have your hardened ideologue. They're saying something. Now, you um, come through with a find their contradiction and or reveal the unintended or secondary consequences. And now the misinformed person, if they hear this, mm -hmm. they go, I never thought of that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I like this because you're figuring out who you're dealing with. And you can apply these whether you're testifying at a hearing or whether you're just in normal conversation right. or whether you're calling a radio station. So you're basically saying you have to analyze who you're talking to first. Right. And then you adjust your strategy accordingly. See, look how practical that yeah. is. Yeah. Now, I have pie equals practice. Uh -huh. And taste um, is within practice. That's your technique. Okay. That's your body language. You use a controlled, pleasant, and respectful tone. Something that um, our opposition is recently not doing a lot of, they're, they're not using controlled, pleasant tones, are they? <laughs> well, I've noticed the left has, has become very, since Trump was elected, they, they've gone hysterical on us, yeah. which to me is a good thing because they kind of sense that they may have suffered a setback. But um, uh, Well, and, and I don't have my, my uh, scripture verse memorized here. I had a note here that whenever you are uh, using a uh, written or a spoken communication uh, as part of your technique, make sure that you have a, a 2 Timothy 1, 7 kind of uh, aspect. Or, as my mom would say, you catch more flies with sugar than with vinegar. Well, see, that's, that's very important to understand because let's take a look at, I'll just say this fast because I know you're wanting to continue, but you take Barry Goldwater in the 60s and Ronald Reagan in the 80s. Barry Goldwater lost a landslide election in, what, 1964? Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan won two landslide elections in 1980 and 1984. Both men were saying the same thing. But what Goldwater said with a scowl, Reagan said with a smile. Yeah. And so there's a lot to be said for tone. In other words, how you say things, either in written form or verbally, is, is just as important uh, as what you're saying. Yes. So that's a great point. And then terrible is time. So uh, my note here is rehearsal helps to shorten the time to express one's positions mm -hmm. as time is always short and or interrupted. Especially if you uh, do get to visit with an elected official one-on-one, -on -one, you're not going to get to speak with them for five or ten minutes. Mm -hmm. If you send a letter, you shouldn't send a five-page letter. You need to ha have a one-page letter. So when it comes to your time, you go back here to organize and you think about what what your talking points are. Mm -hmm. And you only need a couple. Okay. You know, two, maybe three talking points because you're not going to have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And um, you, know, you, you still need to have your little pleasantries mm -hmm. uh, in the conversation. So now um, this was all within uh, pepper on pie tastes terrible. Well, I have... Um, a second way to accomplish these actions is to build a personal network mm -hmm. uh, for fellowship and to encourage one another and to collaborate. And the, the reason this is so significant is because there is so much going on and a person can feel overwhelmed and discouraged, which I think is uh, part of the spiritual uh, attack yeah, that we're under. Satan wants us to feel isolated and alone when in reality there's a groundswell of people that think exactly like we do. Yes. So, you know, build a network and uh, as part of that, you know, ask people to pray for you. Amen. Uh, you know, as you're going through this pepper on pie tastes terrible, uh, then you are uh, identifying perhaps several prayer needs. Okay. And so you can ask someone to help you, you know, through those prayer needs. And, you know, I, ha I have scriptural basis there yep. for the, all that, uh, that the Lord wants us to stir one another up and, and to encourage one another. Mm -hmm. 
And then uh, the third thing is to invite staff persons of elected officials for legislative updates. So the left is threatening to um, storm the town halls. Mm -hmm. and, and that's our right as a, a citizen to have our elected representative come out here and tell us what's going on. But the left is trying to intimidate them. They're trying to intimidate us. And they're saying, oh, we're going to go to all these town halls and we are going to disrupt them. And we're going to heckle and nobody's going to be able to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't think about the secondary consequence. The secondary consequence is we can invite uh, either the elected official or their staff representative to come visit us mm -hmm. in, in our setting. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's a great point. And I remember when I testified in favor of HB, I can't remember the number, you might remember it, which dealt with the abortion clinics and putting more regulations on them in the state of Texas, which by the way, an out of control judge knocked down, you know. But um, I remember I, and they were taking, uh, I had a chance to testify before one of the committees. Mm -hmm. I had three minutes. Yes. And you had to sit there all day and wait for your turn. So they don't have time to listen to one of my sermons. They can go a little bit longer than three minutes sometimes. <laughs> I had three minutes to organize my thoughts and spit out what I wanted to say. And so I like your strategy here because what you're talking about is preparing how you're going to speak ahead of time. And what you're saying is you can apply this in many different levels. You yes. can, If you're giving a testimony like I was, you can apply this. If you're writing a, something to the newspaper editorial section, you could apply this. If you're talking to your elected representative, you can apply this. If you're talking to a friend at church, you can apply this. So pepper is plan. Uh, on is organize. Mm -hmm. And this is where you sort of went, went into, you use a strategy based on who you're talking to. And yes. You had, you had three categories. Pi is practice. Uh, and tastes is technique. Tests, tastes is technique. And terrible is time. Yes. Uh, so budget your time accordingly. So this is a great strategy. And then you had a couple other things that we could do outside of your mnemonic device related to encouraging one another and getting to know staff members. So we wanted to sort of... Uh, deal with this because sometimes we get accused of just t talking about how bad it is without giving people steps. So we've described the collision between false civil rights and right of conscience. We've given people action steps that they can take. Voting, pastoral protection legislation, the type of legislation that Rick Miller uh, tried to get passed here in the state of Texas the guide from Matt Staver's organization, and then um, a technique that you've given us here, you know, when we, when we kind of wade into these waters, because most people haven't, Christians haven't gone down this road. So they need something very practical to help them when they move into this area. And then you've also talked about getting to know staff persons and developing networks, which is kind of what we're doing here with our Facebook live feed. So I think uh, we've been very practical today, don't you? Yes. <laughs> and we have time for one quick question. One guy writes in and says, Charles Clough has proposed that in states, now before I continue, he has a little article on this, a booklet, which I think you can get through Tyndale Theological Seminary. Charles Clough has proposed that in states with no such protections that pastors like myself, there's a pastor here writing this, perform church weddings before the Lord but, uh, but not perform legal marriages authorized by the state. Uh, what is your opinion of this tactic to avoid legal complications, especially in democratically controlled states like Pennsylvania? It seems that the marriage battle has already been lost for the most part. Um, I would encourage people to get Charles Clough's booklet on this through Tyndale Seminary or also through his ministry called the Framework uh, Series Ministries. 
I believe is the name of it. If you go to his website, you can find this. And he's got all kinds of neat things because uh, he's thought through a lot of these issues because he's in the state of Maryland. Uh, and he goes to a church in Maryland, which is very blue. And um, he's always worried about local pastors who aren't protected the way we are protected here in California, uh, Texas. Texas. There we go. And so um, he's got some uh, neat things to think about. And his suggestion of performing weddings before the Lord, but not performing legal marriages anymore, uh, is one uh, option that's, that pastors in blue states have. So I would recommend you think about that. And I'd recommend Charles Clef's uh, material. And, you know, we're out of time. So um, did you want to come back and do a, another part on this, or do you think we got it done? Or I, I think I got it done, but if you uh, feel like or if there's feedback that they, they want to hear more about this. Okay. Uh, well, let's play it by ear. Advocacy. Here. Let's play it by ear. Uh, we may come back next week and talk more about this, or we may move on to another subject. But the bottom line is we're in a spiritual war. Uh, the legal system of this country is being warped beyond recognition. And no, the day is gone where you can kind of hide behind the Republicans in the White House, so we're okay. Uh, we're in danger. Uh, I think a Democrat in the White House would probably accelerate things. But this trend that we've been talking about you know, is, is not slowing down. Maybe it's slowing down some, but it's continuing to go forward. And so we need to be vigilant in these last days and think carefully about these things. And, um, you know. Can, can I add please, something? Please, please. Um, Bonhoeffer uh, famously said that silence in the face of evil is itself evil. And so when we see what is going on, we can't remain silent. Right, because that is a form of speech, silence. Of course, Bonhoeffer, being the great pastor who stood against uh, the Nazi regime. So anyway, uh, we love everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Like us on Facebook. Share us. And um, we're not sure what we're going to do next week, but you'll have to just tune in and find out. But we hope that you find these programs edifying and encouraging to you. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay.